and planting actually thousands of trees, little ones, but sometimes big ones. And when I have finished, you can't see a single thing that man has done. It looks like it's always been there. So I take people through and they sort of look at it. They don't realize all the hydraulics that have gone into it, the pipes that carry water from one place to another, the falls. It looks like it's just always been there. But I'm not looking for credit anyway. And I think that this park gives a great deal of pleasure to the town of Andes, does it not, Pat? Yes, it does, yes. It's just a lot of people and go they, there and they love so it. They immerse the themselves in it. Mm -hmm. and, I, <laughs> and I have a sign up that says, no motor vehicles. <laughs> but I go through. Tell <laughs> me, I can go through too. You can go through too. Now we're talking a lot about Andes, but it may be that people don't really know where Andes is. Anybody know where Andes is? A few people, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. So it is uh, a little village of 350 people in the midst of a town that is a wider town, and it's in Delaware County. It's about, I'd say, about 45 minutes from here, going in a northwest direction. Uh, it's on Route 28. And so it's the route from, uh, from Kingston through Phoenicia, Pine Hill, Martyrville, Andes. And then if you keep going, you get to Oneonta and Cooperstown, and 28 loops around through the Adirondacks. But that's another story. But So Andes is... Um, it's about an hour from Kingston, out Route 28, just through the Catskill Park to the Northwest Catskills. And it's changing very quickly, too. It wasn't long ago the hills were filled with cows. Every valley had a farm, farms and farms and farms. And some of them were quite remote. And they started to settle these farms in the early 19th century. And they lived very primitively. There were no automobiles then, no TV sets. Work was what they did. They cut the trees, they plowed the fields, they built the stone walls, and they lived a very frugal life. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't have penicillin in those days. A lot of people, even families, died of pneumonia, was a deadly disease. So it wasn't a completely happy life. And they had to work so hard, I wonder sometimes if they were actually aware of the, the beautiful life, the beautiful mountains and the birds, and what constituted Andes at that time. Well, you said you, we had taken a ride last year. We went to where you had rented the place after the war, after. And you talked about uh, the, the, the farm daughter that uh, you had the uh, relationship with out in the backs of uh, Bovina. Why don't you talk about that part of your life when you were painting well, out there? The, the Scotch originally, like the Dutch were around Kingston, but the Scotch went up into these valleys and cleared the lands and had the farms. But in, in the 1930s, for some reason, uh, the Germans were, this was before Hitler, but there was a reason why these Germans were persecuted and left, I think, each Prussia. And they came finally to this country and they found these beautiful valleys around Andes and Bovina. Bovina meaning cows, and it's a, like a dead end road. We went up there the other day. So beautiful, old keystone bridges that are still there. And the valley that you painted I did. the barn in. Yeah. And I had gone there because there was a, a, pr a pretty German girl there that I liked. <laughs> and the family was very involved in work. These German people worked so hard. This is a pastel I did. And I don't know about glare and whatever, but uh, out in Bovina. And this barn is the barn that was connected to the farm where George lived after the war. But I didn't know that when I went out there. Somebody else had told me to go out. We're talking about Delaware County. 
Delaware County in the 1880s was the largest dairy producing county in the United States and had the highest percentage of Scottish born residents of any county in the United States, which is a tidbit I did when I did my research 35 years ago. But anyway, I'll always remember it. But anyway, this is the farm in the area that George is talking about. Yeah. That's a heart. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And what'd you say? It's a heart. Where? Oh. That's yeah, a heart. It feels like oh, it's okay. a heart. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, now I see it. I yep. see bosoms too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so go on with the story. Go so on with the story. Well, the story was... Can I have a question? Uh, yeah, okay. Question where? When he said Okay. I went in the army, I wrote to her, and when they came back, I went up there and I courted her a little bit. But they were very busy working. And Arbeiten, the German word for work, was their philosophy of life. And I remember the girl's mother saying to me, George, you marry Erica, and I will give you a farm and cows, and you can live here. And I thought how hard they work. <laughs> <laughs> and I backed away from it. Because uh, I can remember going out and they just made a pond that they could swim in. And they had things very nice. They ate well. And she sa I said, it's very beautiful. And she said, Ja, George, soon we will have everything. And I thought about that. As a matter of fact, I still think about it. You work hard, and soon you will have everything. What is everything? TV sets, cars, what, computers. In those days, there were no computers. And so this became a part of the philosophy of life. And I thought about security and freedom, and how we give up our freedom in favor of security. And then I visualized myself security as being a horizontal line, and freedom as being the vertical line. And then I think you have to make compromises because there's something very nice about security, but the, the price that you have to pay for security takes away from freedom up here. And freedom is beautiful too. So again, we compromise. And I think all my life has been a question of compromising. And every time I compromise, I die just a little bit. So, and even now, I have just a little money saved, but I realize if I had to go to an old age home, in a very short time, it would all be gone. So what do we do? Here we are sitting, of all the billions of years that have been and are yet to come, you beautiful people are sitting here in the sunshine with me. And I am, my heart is just so full of love. When fear goes, love manifests itself. The enemy of love really is fear. And I don't know what we have to be afraid of, but you talk about the people that were killed yesterday. And as you were talking about the people that were killed yesterday, I think of what we're doing in Afghanistan. But because this is close, it's much more uh, of an impact. But if you were just a little villager in Afghanistan, you know, and the smart bombs come over, so. Or the suicide bombers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know. It's all bewildering. But this moment to me right now, and I'll conclude with this, is a very beautiful moment. And I, I feel the love. I, I feel the love from all of you. I can feel your love. And this, that's all we have in this life is love. It's the only thing that matters. Love in the painting which you express, love in song, music, simple things like cooking. It's such an art. 
It's so beautiful because you can eat it. You can't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you and I love you all. So rich and deep and spiritual and beautiful and and taunting. I feel as though haunting there's or taunting. Haunting. Haunting. Because there's it feels like there's a vapor. It feels like something's gonna a bubble's gonna pop and somebody's gonna jump out from behind a tree. I feel like lives are missing somehow. They're like behind the mountain or around the tree. Like living bugs or cows or whatever. It's there's a the pictures seem alive. They're very alive, but there's something here. <coughs> well, there's maybe a melancholy. I, I, you know, there. We had talked about a phrase for the show, joy, and really. You know, there, there's something, I think, I don't know if I'd say deeper than joy, because joy is a wonderful concept. And uh, then they came up with a Midnight Clear as, you know, a title for the show. But, you know, I think that uh, there is, um, I don't know if i call it a darkness or a sadness or... or But on the other hand, there's real beauty in that because they share a human experience that way. And I think for me, in doing my landscape and, and what I paint, I paint what <coughs> just what, what arrests me and I say that's beautiful and that's what I want to paint. But, you know, the accessibility comes from a shared human experience somehow. So, um, so it's interesting what you said. They have a saturation that pulls you in and makes you want to explore where something else is happening. Okay. Yep. Other, anybody else? Yeah. I think they're kind of calm. Calm. Yeah, because it's, it's almost like the sunset of the day. It's like the evening is approaching of the day. It's almost like it's, you know, when the morning comes, it's bright, sunny. Yeah. This is not bright and sunny. It's it's, um, I don't know, it's kind of like the day is at rest. Yeah. Yeah. The way the light is, not a lot of light. Not agitating. No. Yeah, yeah. Whereas my work, my work has more of a, of a sun energy to it. You know, my work is a more, uh, you know, kind of forceful. But then we all perceive things in different ways for different reasons. But my work has always, uh, you know, said to me how relaxing it is. And when I... of Catskill landscape images uh, and using some of George's work and some of uh, Athena Bilias' uh, paintings and some of my paintings and other artists' work because being in the landscape is a very renewing experience for a human being. You know, there's something that it, it's, it's what you are a part of and so and you can communicate that experience. You know, I said in the beginning that love, the feeling of love, to be able to engender that and communicate that, you know, is a way to do it. Now certainly, you know, you've done uh, nudes, portraits, things, you know, with people. I've actually done a, a few paintings with, with people. I did a lot with, with portraits. But then it's, it becomes also a psychological thing that you're in the painting with some other being.
And this enables you and your consciousness just to completely inhabit the experience. So, and, and, and so I like, it, it's rejuvenating to me to do it. Yes. Did he paint this with the cataracts? Well, yeah. Uh, did, how were your cataracts when you were doing these paintings? Is that something that happened more after? Or the question was, did you paint these with your cataracts? The, the, the last year, it's been the cataract has been developing very rapidly to the point where I got shadow vision. If I saw a bird in the sky, there's the bird just below it. There's another bird, and this detracts from the line of a tree or something. Now that's gone, and I'm seeing colors again that I was losing, and also uh, I'm getting a lot more light coming in. So I was a little afraid of it. I was anxious because my right eye is no good. I lost it on a bulldozer once when I thorn snapped back and went through. So if I lost this eye, I would be blind. And I was trying to evaluate whether I should take the chance of seeing really accurately again or being satisfied with what I could see, which was limited. But my friends all said, do it. And uh, the technique has been greatly improved in the last 10 years for cataract removal. So I had a very good doctor, and she did a beautiful job. And I'm, I'm still getting well from it. It was only a week or two weeks, two weeks ago that I did it. So I did it two weeks ago. And I'm very excited. I say, I don't know what you're saving me for, but you're saving me for something. Well, you got a lot of art materials at the house. A lot of art materials. You gonna do some painting now? Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Sure. Are you still in your gas station? Are you painting in your gas station? In, Are you still no. living the in the studio in the gas station? No. no, no, no. No, I had a beautiful lady. She was my domestic partner. And we lived together for 15 years, and she had a nice house. But unfortunately, she got uh, leukemia and died. So she left me her house, and I sold the gas station. And that's what I'm living on now, is the money from the gas station. And, uh, and I love the gas station. It was one, one room, and I landscaped it with great rocks and trees, beautiful trees, and in back was a brook. So it was very simple and beautiful living in one room. Big windows, but somebody else is enjoying that <laughs> creation now. I, I created that of an old gas station. So it's a piece of art. It's yeah, it is really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I think where we live, the house that we live in, is important. You know, the old houses in Andes are really quite dark because in the olden days it was very difficult to heat them in the wintertime. They heated them with wood. So the, the windows are small and the rooms are fairly large and quite dark, even on a bright day in the summer they're dark. So I love the light coming in, and we don't always get that much sunshine or light in Delaware County. But, you know, the rain is beautiful too. To see the beauty in everything, in a rainy day, in the fog, in the mist, in the snow, and with people also. You can look, and if you are tuned, you can see the 
beauty in a person that other people might call ugly or even deformed. A search for beauty, truth and beauty come very close together. And they say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I don't believe that entirely. I think beauty can exist without a, without a beholder. A little lady slipper growing in the wood is beautiful, even if a person doesn't see it. Or the song of the bird, a person doesn't hear it. The song is there and it is still beautiful. Unfortunately, we tend to think of everything being for mankind, the beasts of the field and the fish in the sea, everything is for mankind. And I don't believe this. I believe mankind is just another creature on this planet that may cease to exist when, when other creatures are still living, but our ego kind of gets in the way and so we destroy the bison, we destroy uh, the homing pigeons, <coughs> and now the polar bears are going, they're not going to be here much longer. So, the lack of respect that we have now for the planet, I think, is dire. And we can deal with nature and try and control it, but there are consequences. Everything that we do has a consequence. And I feel very dismal now about what's happening, like with the fracking and the heating of the planet. And there are still people that will deny gore and overheating the planet, but I don't think that it's possible to deny in the face of what's happening. Anyway, here it is the middle of December and the sun is shining. So this is global warming. Well, I'm sorry that everybody can't go skiing. <laughs> well, the Catskills Christmas time could be 50 degrees and raining or 20 below zero. And in those years I lived in Andes, I had them both. <laughs> okay. I, I didn't hate to talk anymore. I stopped talking. Yeah. Well, I don't want to use any more words. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all, really. And my best friend. I love people that love the Catskills, and I love people that love my paintings, and I love people that love me. <laughs>